Hey, it's McGann, and I'm here with the Coraline book versus movie versus sometimes graphic novel review. All right, here is a huge difference between the Coraline book and movie, and just like the graphic novel, the Coraline novella does not have YB or Mrs. Lovett anywhere in the story. There is also absolutely no mention of the doll that the Beldam uses to lure people into the other world. When Coraline first crosses over into the other world and she notices the picture on the wall, in the movie it's the little boy who has the ice cream and he's happy so it implies that it's a better world than in her world, the real world, where the ice cream has fallen off the cone and the boy looks sad. Well, in the book, the picture is said to look more devious in the face once Coraline enters the other world. Now, a really interesting note I took is that Coraline says that the cat's voice sounds like the voice in Coraline's own head, like her internal voice that she thinks to herself, except that the voice is male in the cat instead of female, like in her head. Oh, and for some reason, Miss Spink and Miss Forcible's dog is named Hamish instead of Angus. In the graphic novel, they showed the Usher dog in the other world Spink and Forcible theater as being a pug, but in the book it was a Scottish Terrier and an old Scottish Terrier. And when the Usher dog comes and asks Coraline for her ticket and she says she doesn't have one, he goes, oh, there's another one without a ticket. And that really implies that Coraline is far from the first person to be there. And that's such a weird detail to add. I feel like there's something there, but again, I'm not quite figuring it out yet. I am a little curious though, because the audience of the theater in all three versions of Coraline have been filled with dogs. And I wonder, are these Miss Pink and Miss Forcible's dead dogs, like the souls of their dead dogs that they brought to cross over into the other world so that they could live on? In the movie, we see that Miss Spink and Forcible have a collection of their dead pets, but there's no implication of them being like that in the book or graphic novel. So I wonder, you know, what are all the dogs about? Especially since the Bell Dam on the surface shouldn't know anything about Miss Spink and Miss Forcible. The only way she could know about them is if they have either been to the other world before or the other mother can read Coraline's mind. In the book, one of the dogs in the audience of the theater also says that chocolate isn't bad for dogs, which goes back again and makes me wonder, are these dogs all the souls of dead dogs that Miss Pink and Miss Forcible have brought over into the other world over the years? Now, both the book and the graphic novel mention daylight time in the other world, and Coraline has to walk through a corridor to go home. Now, in the movie, we see it as this sort of round, narrow tunnel that looks similar to the well, as the theorizer put it. But in the book, the corridor is said to have something that's old and slow in there, and she hears strange voices and distant winds, and, and it's almost like the corridor is maybe something like a wormhole that would transport people from one dimension to another. I'm not really clear and the book doesn't do a really good job explaining it. It really doesn't explain a lot of things. But on the flip side, it gives me an excuse to make these videos and get views. So, you know, whatever. Now, similar to in the movie, in the book, Miss Spink and Miss Forcible do not want to acknowledge that Coraline's parents are missing. And that doesn't make any sense that nobody's like, oh my goodness, your parents are missing. Oh, well, we need to help you. Like, nobody's trying to help her. And even when Coraline calls the police, they don't listen to her. She tells them that her parents are gone and they're just like, oh, ha ha, go tell your mom to make you some warm milk and that I said so. And it's two in the morning. Like, why would they think that a kid is calling to make this up at two or three in the morning? It's just really bizarre. And it makes me think that that is supportive of my theory that once Coraline enters the other world, she never goes back to the real world. She goes to a limbo pink palace world. And that's why all the other characters that Coraline interacts with won't really acknowledge or help her with any of her problems so that she's forced to go back into the other world and be with the Bell Dam. Now, the book and the graphic novel also both mention that the mirror on the wall where Coraline finds her parents and they write, help me on the glass. They both mention that that mirror came from an old wardrobe and that it was a very old wardrobe that it had come out of. And I wonder if that proves the theorizer's theory that the Bell Dam was the original owner of the house because... I'm not really clear why else they would make such a point to talk about how old that this uh, mirror is. When uh, Coraline goes back to the other world for her final trip where she's going to go save her parents, the cat starts talking as soon as he hits the uh, corridor area. And I believe in the movie when they go back through the tunnel, the cat starts talking in the tunnel too. But in the movie, they show the other YB open the door from the other world leading back to the real world. 
And Coraline says, come with me. And the other YB takes off his glove and blows away his hand, suggesting that he couldn't survive going over to the real world. But now we have definitive proof that the magic can work through the tunnel. So why would the other YB not be willing to go any farther with Coraline unless it's the fact that other YB is controlled by the other mother and his helping Coraline is all part of the other mother's greater plan so that Coraline feels safe and she thinks she has people to trust when she actually doesn't. If you haven't watched my other theories on Coraline, I suggest you go back and do that first before you continue any farther because I'm really going to talk round and round in circles about it. And when Coraline returns in the book for the last time to the other world, she feels that the corridor gets longer and that there is something keeping pace with her. And the other mother's hair is constantly described as floating and being tentacle-like, whereas in the film it is not dynamic at all. And I'm not sure if that's supposed to imply she's some kind of Medusa monster. Again, this book covers a lot of what happens, but they don't really cover any why they happen, so there's a lot of confusion and room to theorize here. Now, in the book, the other father looks at Coraline at one point and says, No point. There isn't anywhere but here. This is all she made. The house, the grounds, and the people in the house. She made it all and she waited. Now, that could be interesting for several reasons, especially since the other father says that the Bell Dam has been waiting yet Coraline and her family haven't lived in the house for very long. And I think that this supports my theory that Coraline never really returns to the real world. She's in the Limbo Pink Palace because it flat out says that the other mother is making everything that Coraline wants to see. And at the end of the book, Coraline gives the stone with the hole in it back to Miss Spink and Miss Forcible, but she never looks in through it once she's in the real world, what she believes is the real world. And that seems a very suspicious thing to do, and that makes me believe even more that because she never checks, there's all the more reason to suspect that she's in the limbo pink palace. Now, in the film, we see the cat run off and grab a mouse and, and crunch down on it and kill it, and it becomes a rat. And in the book, the cat finds a rat, and he lets it go, and he goes and grabs it again, lets it go, goes and grabs it, playing cat and mouse with the rat. And the cat makes a comment that his way of doing things is more merciful because every so often a meal might escape. But the way that the cat kept catching and releasing and catching and releasing the rat makes me think of the relationship between the Bell Dam and Coraline is that Coraline thinks she's getting away from the Bell Dam when actually she never does. And funny enough, too, after all this emphasis on the mirror and showing Coraline what her parents are doing through the mirror and Coraline seeing her parents trapped in the mirror in the real world, the Bell Dam says mirrors are never to be trusted. And that's not only interesting from what's going on with Coraline's parents, but also where does Coraline find the ghost children? The ghost children, for all intents and purposes, are inside of a mirror. The Bell Dam also has different keys in the book. She has a key that makes the mirror work. She has a key for the empty apartment next door, and she has a key for the door to the real world. Which would mean, logically, there is no reason why the Bell Dam couldn't have a second, third, fourth, fifth, or however many keys she wanted that opened a door from the real world to her world. And when Coraline does meet the ghost children, it is odd because they, again, do not say anything clearly about how or why the Bell Dam killed them. They say that they saw the Bell Dam and then never saw their real parents again. They say that she ate up their lives. They say that she took their hearts. They say all these different things that are really vague. And at one point the ghosts say, she'll keep you here while the days drag to dust and the leaves fall and the years pass and on and on and on she went. Which again sounds to me like the Bell Dam's goal is not to kill the children, it's to feed off of the children. Another of the ghost children say, it doth not hurt when they refer to being killed by the Bell Dam, as if the death was not violent, but it was long and slow and drawn out like they lived their lives. Another comment made was, she has our hearts in her keeping, which suggests to me that it was love, that the Bell Dam tricked them into loving her in a very legitimate way. And I think that works nicely, very much so with my Coraline Theory Part 6. And as for the love thing, the Bell Dam emphasizes how she just wants to love Coraline over and over and over again. If the Bell Dam really wanted to hurt Coraline or eat her or steal her soul, she could have done this by force at any given time. So what is with all this love talk if it is not for the sake of feeding off of that energy? In the book, the other mother swears on her right hand that she won't cheat at the game, which is funny because that seems to be the hand that crosses over to the real world in the book and movie. 
And Coraline does mention that in the other world, there is no well, which makes me wonder, well, is that because the well is already a portal to the other world, so they don't need to have one in the other world? There's also a weird moment in the movie that I've never quite been able to put together where Coraline is starting up the game with the other mother, and the other mother just keeps tapping at her black little button eyes, click, click, click. And I finally realized when reading the book that Coraline was asking for a clue as to how big the size of souls were. And that was her clue. The other mother was clicking her eyes saying about the size of buttons without saying anything. Because for some reason in the movie, they say that the objects Coraline goes to find are the eyes of the children, which is, was always weird to me because there's only one circle for each child. But in the book, it is their soul that is in that object, and that's what she's trying to get. In the book, the uh, stone with the hole in it, when Coraline looks through it, it gives a green fire trail leading her to where the first soul is hidden. And the first soul is not in the garden. It's actually in her toy box in her room. And now in the book, there's a moment where Coraline is exploring and the bell dam sends her into the empty apartment next door because in the book, there are four apartments, not three. And when Coraline goes into the other apartment that's empty, she ends up finding the other father and he's turning into this like shapeless bread-like monster. And he says very clearly that the other mother is controlling him and telling him that he has to hurt her, which means that he does not have free will and he is not independent. And that seems to prove that everything that the other characters do is through the direct instruction of the bell dam. Coraline even says to the other father, I bet she made you come down here as punishment for telling me too much. And it says, he hesitated, then nodded. So why would you hesitate and have to think about it unless you're actually the other mother hearing this and going, oh wait, that's a good idea. Yeah, I'm going to agree to that. During her last escape from the other world, Coraline mentions that the thing in the corridor must be older than the bell dam and that she feels this fine downy fur and she pulls her hand back against the wall and then she tries to touch the wall again and feels like she put her hand in a mouth but it never bothers to explain what the heck that is and that's making me nuts and if you know can you please share it with me because I'm losing my mind wanting to know what this furry thing is hiding in there. And here's another interesting point is similar to the movie as Coraline collects the souls of the children, the other world starts to fall apart. But yet it isn't until that night when Coraline is asleep that the souls are said that they're set free and she looks under her pillow and the objects that contain the souls are broken. So if they weren't set free once she grabbed them in the other world, then why does the other world start to break down like it does? It has to be an elaborate trick from the bell dam so that Coraline thinks she's safe in, in the fake real world when she's in a limbo zone and still being trapped and controlled and being fed off of by the bell dam. Now in the last few pages of the book, Coraline mentions that someone told her that thing about falling down the well and looking up and seeing a sky full of stars in the middle of the day. But it's someone. She doesn't designate who said this, even though Coraline's world does not seem to be very big from what we see in the book or movie. And like I said, there's no YB and there's no YB's grandma. So it's like, who told her this if it wasn't Miss Spink or Forcible or Mr. Bobinski or her parents or something like that? Who could have possibly known about this well to tell her this? Well, interestingly enough... Miss Spink makes a comment to Coraline that Mr. Lovat, who was here before your time, said that he thought it might go down for a half mile or more, meaning the depth of the well. Mr. Lovat, are you kidding me? That can't be a coincidence, considering that YB's grandmother is Mrs. Lovat. But yet there is no twin sister character that was abducted. Instead, there is a fairy ghost child in her place. And the fairy says that she has been stuck in the other world for centuries. There's also some really creepy song stuff going on with the rats. And I can't figure out for the life of me what it's supposed to mean. Maybe if I read the book 20 times, I'd figure it out. But it, I just, I'm not seeing it right now. So you can go through these and pause it and hopefully read it. And if you have any thoughts on this, please leave it in the comments for me. Because I'm a little, I have no clue what to do with this information.